Our guest tonight is a General Authority 70 and Church Commissioner of Education for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He's also a former president of BYU-Idaho and president and CEO of both the Deseret News and Deseret Digital Media. He earned his doctorate at Harvard, his master's at Stanford, and did his undergrad at BYU. That's something else that Blaine and I have in common yes, with him. Yes, exactly. um, <laughs> His Cougars are ranked 7-0, and and they're ranked number 11 in the country. A pleasure to welcome Elder Clark Gilbert to the Wise Guys. Uh, what do you think of the place? You guys have a great setup. It <laughs> looks just like my basement. Does it really? <laughs> we don't. Don't. You're one of the few that knows where we are. So, yeah, yeah. And, and for security reasons, we just tell them we're in an undisclosed, undisclosed location somewhere in Provo. But so. it's like the ultimate uh, Cougar fan cave. Uh, and we had to add some teams when the league expanded, so we had to move some things around. Yeah, U- Utah's way over there behind <laughs> They're the, in, the in the corner. We had some complaints early that the U was too predominant on yeah, the wall, so we moved it. You know, we're, we had to move it. So we had to do that. Hey, uh, let's start with some really hard questions. What did you think of that game Saturday oh, or Friday? It was, it was so fun. And I don't get to go to a lot of games. Right. I'm usually on an assignment for the church. And the assignment I had last weekend was moved to another date, and suddenly I found myself <laughs> able to join, and it was great. We were there with all of our family and my nephews and my sons, and it was just a wonderful setting. Did you did you just sit out in the stands with the family, or were you up in the in the box? Uh, we were in a separate area with just our family. Oh, yeah. nice. So, I hope nice. you had a heater. We had a heater over at our BYU TV I, I, I compound. I want to know, was your, did your family go crazy like Dave and I did when they completed that last <laughs> that last catch? <laughs> it was amazing. And uh, when they scored right before the end of that game, with a minute 13 left on the clock, I thought they shouldn't have done that. Yeah. When, when we Oklahoma thought it was too State, much time. Yeah. They made a mistake they, because I knew we were going to come back. I didn't know. Oh, how when we'd Oklahoma do it. State scored, yeah. you're like, ah, oh, big mistake. Yeah. That's the kind of confidence we used to have in like Jim McMahon and Steve Young and these guys. <laughs> he had it already in Jake Retz's life. Let me tell you what we were doing. We shifted to a pregame, a postgame show that was going to be about a game that got away. And then in a matter of 50 seconds, the postgame show shifted to one of the greatest finishes that folks have watched <laughs> at that football stadium. What has impressed you the most about this team as they've marched through their first seven games? You know, I think last year was so difficult and the end of the season was so difficult. I think this team has come in uh, with a lot of humility, uh, coaches, uh, principles of love and learn. You see in both of those coming out and after every game you watch, and he's got that team working on what they need to improve on. And there's just been some special things in the culture of this team that makes it not only fun to cheer for them athletically, but you know there's something deeper that coaches and the players, the leadership core of this team, have really brought to this experience. You've been involved in education for a long, long time, and, and coaches really are teachers. It's what they do. They're teachers. They're instructors. Kalani keeps saying, oh, it's just so much easier to, to teach and for these guys to learn making mistakes while we win. Um, I mean, does that carry over into teaching and other facets of life? Like win and learn, lose and learn. I mean, there, there's something to be learned from both, but it sure seems like winning and learning is a lot more fun. Well, it's a lot more fun. Sometimes it's harder, though, because you're not as humble. Yeah. And I think that it was probably good that this could have gone the other way. And I think that will get them ready for this weekend. And, and uh, there, there is a deep culture. And, you know, it, it's been fun to watch teams over the years. And I, I love Bronco Mendenhall and the culture he brought to BYU around our mission. And I think Kalani is just so deeply committed to why we do this. And... And you guys know, I, I, we've seen you at games over the years before I had this church calling. And yeah. We've been lifelong Cougar fans. And, um, but it has to be why you matter in a deeper way. And I, I remember coming and watching these, these teams as a young boy uh, growing up in Scottsdale, Arizona. I was a religious minority. Um, and... Somehow on the weekends when BYU was winning all those games, it just, it said to me, I'm part of something special. I'm part of something that matters. My faith isn't so strange and so weird that we can't perform at this high level. And 
even as a father, when I'd bring my kids home from Boston. Yeah, that, yeah, that took some work. Feeling. You had to raise Cougar fans, yeah. but you were in Boston. <laughs> but they are Cougar fans. My son James, <laughs> who's listening, is such a Cougar fan. But when we come back, it's not just that we cheer for sports. It's that these teams do, do it in a special way. And I think uh, this football team is doing it in a special way. And I think that starts with the coaches but boy, the player leadership core, yeah. um, they, they are special and they, they, are, they are pushing the team to be better and keep improving and, and also to stand for something more. And so it's, you know, I always cheer for BYU, but when they can reflect the values of the church and of the university, another it's another gear and it's deeper and it's more meaningful andrew on the live stream from orlando florida and uh, brett from michigan good to have you guys with us an exciting time all the sports are doing well president reese was on our pregame show on saturday and we said gee if there's a every president in the country would love to have this kind of vibe on their campus and you've got it and then of course the crowd went nuts and and he had a great time basketball's coming up with all the hoopla there do you recall a a more special time uh, for Cougar Nation, and then than what we're currently in. You know, there's been there's been pockets when basketball and football were both doing well, and of course Jennifer Rockwood's doing amazing things with women's soccer and Diljeet with the cross country team, and um, it it this is a special time, and and I think Dave, it's it's on and off the field of play, and that's one of the things that is so important to us as leadership in the church it has it has to be both and you look at seven and oh you looked at the top ranked teams but if you look off the field you know you see in my instagram feed the missionary moment from the mm -hmm. football team or a couple of years ago jennifer the rockwood had the women's soccer team playing in the national championship and on sunday the day before they're in church right. and you know, one of her players is opening her mission call on the eve of that game. And and even with all this excitement for basketball, uh, we're doing it in a different way. And, you know, I, I'm i going to read a, I've got a quote here from Kalani that I just love. He says, more than anything, this was in, in Las Vegas, he shared this in the, in the Big 12 in meetings. The Big 12 meetings. Yeah. And he said, more than anything, BYU's success in the Big 12 depends on keeping our faith and our belief in what we know to be right. Having faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that's first and foremost of BYU. If we work through that, everything else will work out. And then this statement, Jesus is the great example that we can follow. It works in personal life, in business, and it definitely works in football, especially at BYU. And I, I believe that. I believe when we chase after something else at BYU, not only do we miss our core purpose, but it won't work at BYU. These teams have to be grounded in the mission of the university, just like everything else at BYU. And that's one of the things I've been so impressed about this football team. What I love is that they accomplish that. But as you look at the rosters, they're not all return missionaries. Yeah. Many of them aren't even members yeah. of the faith, but they've yeah. bought into, yeah. here's how, here's what we represent while we're here. Yeah. And you can go up and down the football roster, including the guy who caught the game-winning touchdown yeah. the other night. And those are all kids you wish everyone could have lunch with. Yeah, and they're good kids, and they came to BYU for those deeper reasons. And Kalani recruits that way. It's not like, well, someone tell him about the honor code at, at the last minute. He, he recruits for the family culture, the love and learn culture. He teaches the honor code. And we expect that from all of our coaches and Shane Reese and Keith Vorkink and Tom Homo. Top to bottom, uh, they do that the right way. Did, did you see, so my youngest son is coaches the safeties yes. right now, Gavin. And he came home from the Baylor game, and he goes, oh, Dad, you know what the coolest thing about the Baylor game was? I said, what was it? He goes, I, I don't know if you noticed or if they even caught it on camera, but like the two teams sat down and prayed together, yeah. kneeled down and prayed together after the game, and it was really, really cool. And I thought, wow, that's what he took out of that game, which is awesome yeah. to begin with. There are some like-minded universities in this conference. Um, 
Did you feel like the Big 12 it was the best place for BYU to be because of that? There's no question. I think the fan bases reflect that. I think some of the coaches do. Certainly, you mentioned Baylor. Linda Livingstone, the president there, is a very good friend of President Reese's, a very good friend of mine. Uh, she, she has said, we are unambiguous about our commitment to Jesus Christ. And how many university presidents outside of BYU would say that? And so we, we love that. And if you look at what BYU TV is doing with the big stories, yeah. um, the, the profile on Baylor was so good. And, and you talk to the team who's producing these, and they say, we want to show the light of Christ in our opponents. And who, who else does this in college football? And the, the thing is, the schools are paying attention. And yeah. talk about a way to introduce BYU into this conference between the big stories and the service projects when we're on the road. Uh, one, one, of the, one of the commenters like said, I've heard at these tail, at tailgates, you know, bring your own beer. I've never heard <laughs> bring your own diapers and food and books and supplies. And, you know, and we're doing these for community needs in the communities where we're playing and it it is i mean my hats off to our alumni association to byu tv um i i i i when we played wyoming yeah uh they 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 did a profile of the service projects we're doing leading up to the game and every major news station in wyoming every nbc abc cbs ran stories on the service project and they said we hope wyoming wins on the field but byu is winning in our community yeah or yeah. when you know when we went to K kansas uh, state's uh, quarterback and all of that went on with that they said man we're having a really hard time not liking byu even yeah. though they just beat us right and isn't that what we want to do that, that's absolutely and i just got to share one more story on that west virginia um, President Reese got a letter from the faculty, head of the faculty association at the University of, uh, at West Virginia University, and she said, "We have a tradition: when our opponents come out on the field, we boo them." And she said, "BYU came out, and we'd heard all these good. We'd heard about the service projects, and we'd seen these big stories you do, but we still were going to boo you when you came out." And then BYU came out holding the West Virginia flag. And she said, no one knew what to do. <laughs> and uh, in, in her letter, th this is just so fun. Let me just pull this, sure. this note from uh, President Reese shared this with me. She said to him, thank you for bringing loving energy to Morgantown and for reminding all of us, as the BYU TV page states, football is indeed more than just a game. That's... That's why we do this, and we have to we have to do that, or else this investment is hard to justify. Right. And and winning helps because it puts all these things that BYU is doing in the spotlight. Yeah. And so, and people think you can't win and do all these yeah. things. And when BYU does win, they go, "Wow, maybe the good guys do finish first once in a while." Is that is that an important? part of it they well, don't have to win every game but they with them being successful isn't that better yes, overall and we, we it, the winning expands the platform yeah but here's the tension and you know i know we have some diehard crazy fans who are just staying up in tokyo and singapore and <laughs> germany you know watching the cougars from far away and yeah. but the temptation is okay so if winning will do this then we need to win at all costs and that, that, that's what you know, Shane Reese and Keith Vorkink and Tom Homo and Coach have to preserve. And we want them to succeed. We want them to be successful. But there are a lot of pressures coming on college athletics today. And it could be very tempting to become just like another college team and think the ends justify the means. Pleased to have Elder Clark Gilbert, Commissioner of Church Education and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints on The Wise Guys, presented by Brady Plus and distributed by the Deseret News. Also pleased to have Mahan Rayan from Indonesia and Jared on the stream from Phoenix. As Commissioner of Church Education, what do you do? 
So my role as commissioner is to provide the support to our presidents and be the interface from the Church Board of Education to each of the presidents. And so the Church Board of Education is made up of the first presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So it's chaired by President Nelson, and the first and second vice chairman are the, his counselors. Then there's an executive committee that rotates in the 12. Currently, that is chaired by Elder D. Todd Christofferson and Elder Ronald A. Rasband. Um, and, and I am in a role where I need to articulate their vision to the presidents. Now, we don't micromanage the presidents. I don't come in and you know, say, here's a, I got a great play for third and long. That's, <laughs> that's run this. And you know, you could. <laughs> <laughs> Klein would probably listen to you. Yeah. So um, we, we try to keep it principle based, but I, I really manage the interface from the first presidency to the presidents. And it's a very different role than when I was a president and, yeah. you know, had all of those employees that reported to me and led those. I ran BYU Pathway, I ran BYU Idaho. Uh, here, my role is really to build and support the presidents and make sure that they're doing things that reflect the will of the Church Board of Education. Let me let me ask a, a question I know everyone would love to ask you, uh, if they could, and I know you met with the First Presidency before this, this interview. When it comes to BYU athletics, what do they think? Well, I, I you know, they, they love our team and they love our coaches, but at the core they want to make sure we're doing this in a way that reflects the values and principles of the church. In the end of the day, we are the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and our teams have to reflect that just like our academics do or our law school does. And, and they know, um, you know, it, it always makes me smile a little bit when people think, well, they don't know what's going on with this or that. And, and it doesn't matter the topic. Everyone with some domain expertise thinks they, <laughs> they know it and yeah. the church leadership doesn't. And, and I just have to smile because they know exactly what's coming. They know the uh, secular and financial pressures coming down on this industry. They see the risks that it could have to take us away from our core mission. Um, and they're very in tune with that. And they, they want to make sure that BYU, in all of its efforts, always reflects the values and mission of the church. And we take that very seriously. And, and so I'm, and that starts with our people. And, you know, coaches, players, um, our alumni, uh, BYU TV, and they want to make sure we're hiring people who fit that culture. You bring up an interesting. Um, a point about oversight and what they want to accomplish down here. And I think, wow, athletics in this day and age at this level requires a lot of funding. Yeah. Like it's, you have to have dollars to compete. How is that managed uh, by the church? And, and it does the church directly fund athletics or are they, or is it funded on its own? And what does the church think about the whole financial picture to compete at the highest level yeah, these days? Let, let me walk you through two extremes because I, I hear two different voices, neither of which is right, but I hear them a lot. Okay. On the one end, it's, we need to be, you know, we got to start catching up. Look how good we're doing now, but we got to be like Texas or Alabama, you know, and more money, more facilities, higher payment, you know, and just chasing after that. On the other hand, I have people, even people who love the BYU Cougars, and they say, Elder Gilbert, we're the church of Jesus Christ on the earth. We care about repentance and the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're helping poor people around the world. You know, they'll point out, you, you know, Elder Gilbert, the needs of the BYU Pathway students. Yeah. How can we be spending this much money on a game? And I have to have answers to both audiences. And can I just you bet. Yeah, what, play out well, how I, I want to know the answers to both, to both yeah. You know, on, on the, why can't we be like other universities? This sounds an awful lot like First Samuel. 
Now, I know you two are scriptorians, so oh, yeah. I, I, especially some, the Old Testament. Some of yeah. our audience—he's my, bo- yeah. my boss in the church, by the way. <laughs> some of our audience may be asking. He's the stake Sunday school president, and I'm the Sunday school president in our ward. So we run a loose boss. organization. He's okay. my boss. Well, First Samuel eight twenty. We need a king that we also may be like all nations. I mean, this is as old as the Old Testament. And we've got to be just like everyone else. And, um, you know, if that, if that was the case, you know, I spent 10 years of my life in Boston. I'm a huge Red Sox fan. Why don't we just say, forget it. We'll all cheer for the Red Sox. Or maybe I should pick a team with a better record this year. But um, <laughs> Don't come to the Cubs. We were just as bad. <laughs> but, but there's a reason it's BYU. And you put that name on it, and it has to mean something different. And, um, you know, it, it's interesting. At, athletics, on, the, on this point, everyone's like, oh, but it's, athletics is different and peculiar. It is not. This conversation we're having with humanities faculty with law school faculty, with psychology faculty, you know, and a king, a king, we need a king, is a constant pressure coming down. we got to be just like everyone else. And the answer to all of that, whether it's on the faculty, in humanities, with our facilities, is no, we are going to be different. This was President Kimball's message in the second century address at BYU. Right. This was President Holland's message to the faculty that BYU will have to stand alone. And if we don't, the rest of the world in the end will say, BYU who? And he says, if we don't have the courage to be different, we'll become just another team. And so you look at this and look, you know, this, this is what I say to someone who says, a king, a king, we need a king. We need to be like... Everyone else. Everyone else. And you know, look, we do. We make investments. We're competitive. We, we have incredible facilities. But there's some things the church does to make sure we don't drift. And this is, by the way, this is true for football. But I could be having the same conversation with a friend on the faculty or a prospective hire to the faculty. Um, first of all, our board of trustees is who I said they were. Um, second, all binding decisions go through the president, through President Reese, to me, and then to the full board. No one else can bind the university in any other way. Not Tom Homo, not the, the uh, donors, not our coach. Uh, president Reese is a singular point, and he does that in coordination with the board. There is no, this is important too, there's... If you like what you're watching, you can help us out by subscribing and hitting that notification button. There's no direct tithing that goes to support athletics. Now, this is a good and a bad thing because the good thing is we use tithing for the core work of the church. The bad thing is this could make someone say, well, great, we can just do whatever we want. Mm -hmm. And that, but the governance remains universally tied to the church board of education. Coaches' salaries are internally funded. They are not funded by donors, despite all the rumors and all the speculation. They come, they're funded by athletics through, from athletic revenue and are completely under the control of the university. We have no debt funding. I mean, I look at Washington State with, what, quarter billion dollars in debt? Right. And then the conference changed. How are they ever going to pay that out? We don't do that at BYU. We don't do that in BYU athletics. We remain anchored on the honor code, ecclesiastical endorsement, our dress and grooming standards. We also retain the ability to act independently, including who we recruit and who we admit to the school. So all of these things protect us from drifting. And you know, one of the biggest ways is hiring the right people. And, you know, I look at Tom Homo, I look at Kalani Satake, I look at Kevin Young, Dilji Taylor, you know, Jennifer Rockwood, just, Heather Olmstead. You go on and on and on. These people get what it means to be at BYU. They do not see it as a constraint. They see it as our competitive advantage. And if we ha- end up hiring coaches 
who wanted to go a different direction, it will be a double whammy. It will hurt who we are, and they won't be successful. As you balance that, and here comes NIL, yep. and here comes paying players, yep. um, and to raise money to do that. Um, the, uh, initially, when that all came out, there was the question of, would they, would they, would they just so, you know what, we're out. Yep. This isn't a game we want to play. Yep. But as a result, you the school turned around, hired Kevin Young, and he's building his basketball program, sold out the Marriott Center for every game, and they don't start for a few more weeks. Yep. Um, and that investment of will be competitive, and to go back to what you said, it may not be chasing the top dog, yep. but you also are committed to being competitive. Yeah, and, and the church isn't going to weigh in on specific dollar amounts or recruits or you know that that's the job of the university, but we will lay out some principles. And you know, one is uh, we can never become a place where the culture is pay for play. We would undermine everything at BYU if that wins out. And it's tempting to buy one player, one person at a time. And if they don't fit the mission, we'd unravel everything, right? And and I'll come back to that because I have a lot of confidence in our in our athletics administration and our coaches. Um, it probably means while we're competitive, as you said, we'll, um, we'll be respectful. I think these players can go lots of places. I mean, I still remember you're, you're looking at a guy who left the Harvard Business School, and I found out what I would be making the day I started my job at BYU-Idaho. It was the first time I actually knew the amount, and you could maybe call, call that gross negligence, <laughs> but I knew I was supposed to be there. Yeah. And uh, I, I wouldn't ask that of all of our coaches, but, but people who come here are, are always will, will be respectful of them. They'll be competitive payments, but we're never going to chase the highest salary for coaches or players. And we have to be drawing on what's unique about the culture. Um, and if, if we don't, I don't think you win here. Um, and I love that quote I shared from Coach Sitake at the beginning. He's like, it works in football, especially at BYU. And look, th there's a lot of things that aren't in our control, and there's things going through with the House settlement, with the uh, NCAA uh, negotiations. We'll have to work within that. But if it ever came down to we have to, the only way to stay in this is to walk away from our values, that, that would be the end of athletics at BYU. Yeah. And, um, and so, look, this is not going to happen because we are committed to it from the, the board to the commissioner to the president to the athletics director to the coaches. We have a culture here that is exceptional. And, and I'm confident it won't happen. There's no other place like this. You By know, the way, uh, Lane, De Debate wants to say, I uh, want to say hello to Elder Gilbert from Chile. Tonight. Oh, how about so, that? Hey, Chile's well, in the house. Chile's well, in the house. We get South America a lot. noches. Adelante con valor. <laughs> there you go. There you go. It, it's interesting because as I listen to you talk, Dave and I are close enough to it that we hear that sometimes we don't share these because we can't, but the inside recruiting stories um, – from some of these current basketball players. Yeah. I think of Yegor Demon's re yeah. recruitment, and we're not going to get into all of it, but I can I can say that the football and basketball programs, along with all the others, they just don't go after anyone. And yeah. Dave and I had lunch with Kevin Young, and he echoed exactly what Kalani's told me over and over and over again as we walk around the neighborhood, and, and that is there's a list of players, and it can't just be these are the top 10 players in the country. It has to be, hey, here's the top 20 players, and here's the three that culturally, spiritually fit. Now, we want to be competitive with the NIL, but we're, we're, we're not going to match what Texas is going to pay him or in basketball what Duke or North Carolina is going to pay him. But they're such a good cultural fit that we're going to lead with the honor code. We're going to lead with the culture. We're going to lead with the environment here. We're going to prepare them to play at the next level. And they're going to have an experience that they're going to love here. So they're going to come here for less. And they're going to fit in so well, they're going to love their experience here. And going to be light whether they're a member of the church or not when they leave. We hear those stories all the time. And they're so personal we don't share yeah. them. But you hear those as well. That's yeah, the way it's supposed and, to work, and right? That's the way it, and that's the way it has worked for a long time. And there are people who are like, no, 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 we got to do this. We got to spend this. And I would just say those people don't get it. 
and it won't last. You might transactionally win once, but you unravel the very competitive advantage. I taught strategy at the Harvard Business School. You unravel the very source of the competitive advantage of the university if you do that. And, you know, on the, on the recruiting, there's a, a good, better, best. You know, a good would be the person, the recruit, understands the honor code, um, understands the standards, and is compliant with those and signs up for them. That's good. Um, better is that this was a, a great coach from, uh, or a great comment from Coach Fanning this summer. Uh, he said, you know, BYU's honor code could be a competitive advantage uh, because BYU will be the place to come play without distraction. And we can sell that. And that's better than simply, okay, I, I agree. I'll cut my hair and, yeah. and I won't go out partying. You know, that's better. This, what Coach Fanning said was better. But then he said, what people don't know. Do you remember this interview? He said, what people don't know is how many people we walked away from. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we, we don't put out a news release and say, we're not recruiting this guy, you know. <laughs> right. And, and maybe that's presumptuous. Like, hey, we're not going after Michael Jordan, you know. And, you know, and, but, but we're going to go after people who fit. And, and that gets to best. And um, if you look at best, they come to BYU because they actually believe in what it stands for. And like you said, Dave, it might not be a member of our church. You know, Jake Retzlaff, I, I pulled this quote from Jake. He said, what I didn't realize, this was in the CBS profile, what I didn't realize is how much the faith of BYU would actually benefit me as a person of faith in my own religion as a Jew. Yeah. Right? Or, um, you know, we, we uh, talked to Canon Catching's mom. They're a Christian family. Their choice to come to BYU was because this was a faith-based institution. And her son's experience, even now, as he's been here, it's even better. They're more loyal to BYU because they know what it stands for. And, you know, and without getting into all the detail, um, there were all kinds of rumors when when Kevin Young was hired about what he was being paid oh, and yeah. all this. But... You know, I remember talking to Kevin during the recruitment, and and he was right there. He was going to be he was going to be an NBA head coach, yeah. and right as he was going to be able to reach up and grab that brass ring, it was gold. Yeah, that ring was gold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. BYU comes along, yeah. and they, I, oh, we have to match that, or else he won't come. Baloney. He wanted to be here because this is a special place. His wife wanted him to be here. You think she would rather have her husband with her, you know, all at nights or yeah. on the road at an NBA every night? Right. And, and, I, and I remember saying to him, oh, Kevin, I was in the same uh, position when I was, I was up for tenure at the Harvard Business School. I'd worked, worked and worked to do that. And Kim Clark, Elder Kim Clark asked me to go to BYU, Idaho. And I'm like, wait, 10 years of my life to be a tenure professor at Harvard. And then my whole career revectors to go to BYU, Idaho. This story isn't unique to Kevin Young or to me. This story is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And Kevin had that humility, and he wanted something different. And that's why he came. And yes, he's paid well. And... Right. But but he could have made more money, and he didn't choose BYU for the money. Right, and people people need to understand that BYU is is they're going to pay Kevin Young a fa- a fair wage. He's taken care of. It's yeah. a good way. They're not saying, "Hey, come and be the lowest paid college basketball coach in the country." They're saying, "Come take a fair wage. We're not going to pay what North Carolina or Duke were going to pay. We're not going to pay what the New Jersey Nets were going to pay on that contract." But we'll be fair. It won't be as much. But here's all these other things. And he said, yeah, sign me up for that. Yeah, right? Yeah. So church, church is going to be fair. He's exceptional. And yeah. he's humble. And he's coachable. And so is Kalani. Mm-hmm. And, and by the way, you know, this is why I j- I've looked at all of our coaches. You know, Kalani, a couple of years ago, as we won the bowl game, it was a great finish. And, and you know, we were kind of limping through to get that victory. And, and someone's like, are you so excited about this? And Kalani pauses and he says, yeah, but we're just on the eve of Christ's birth. 
that's what I'm excited about. And you're like, who, who else says that? And Jennifer Rockwood with her missionaries, I mentioned her before, Dilji Taylor and her support of motherhood and her athletes, or Kevin Young on the recruits he's passed on mm -hmm. that don't get all the headlines. These are our coaches at BYU. And, and if they only came because we paid them the most, we lose that. And that, that has to, it's a sorting mechanism. And it's, look, and you're talking to a person from, from my job at Harvard to BYU-Idaho to running the media companies for the church, the back to president of BYU-Idaho, to president of BYU Pathway, to commissioner of general authority. It was five straight promotions with reduced pay. Yeah, you're losing time. money. Yeah. Every it one was of a those. great strategy <laughs> yeah, for great. wealth yeah. accumulation. Your parents yeah. must be so proud <laughs> over there. Elder Clark Gilbert, Commissioner of Church Education for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, is on The Wise Guys tonight. We're live on YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, and wiseguys.com. By the way, I want to shout out Richard from Panama, Michael from Cedar Park, Texas, Elaine from the southwest Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area, and Jessica, who's flying somewhere between Michigan and Utah right now. Can you listen on the airplane? On, you can do that on the yeah, plane? Yeah, that's what's going down right well, now. Well, then, she's our first, like, over-the-earth <laughs> person on the show. Uh Elder Gilbert, between Fox, ESPN, and BYU TV, how valuable is the exposure that BYU Athletics gets to the overall mission of the university? Well, there's lots of ways for the church to promote itself and for the university to promote itself. Yeah. But uh, we've done a lot of research on the visibility, and um, and that's both on, you know, the, like the BYU commercial that runs. And, um, you know, a couple of years ago, we started making sure we mentioned God in our in our message, and it's like, well, we are a religious university, yeah. and we, we're going to do this. And um, but you know, millions of viewers. You know, when you have a, a Saturday audience of two and a half million, three million people, um, that that you know, we would call it in this business earned media. And yeah. you aren't buying an ad; you're you're drawing attention because of what you're doing and. Um, we see it in our social media, you know, and so it's it's really wonderful. But again, if it doesn't reflect our values, it doesn't matter. So if if it's like you know, we don't look at it and say, oh, we got up to four million, but the team doesn't look like the values of the church, or the coach doesn't reflect the values of the church. It doesn't matter how big it gets. When, again, that's back to my, why don't we just cheer for the Red Sox? <laughs> yeah. I thought the the attention that Jake got uh, last Saturday, week ago. Two Saturdays two ago. Two Saturdays yeah. ago. Uh, on ESPN game day, on CBS, on, on Fox, about uh, being a Jewish quarterback at BYU. And the things he said, and you read yeah. some of his comments earlier, uh, the things he said and how he represented, and then he went out and won the game. Yeah. You just thought, you know what? Could there have been a better day for yeah. the BYU yeah. community than that day? Yeah, and there was a follow-up piece in the Atlantic by McKay Coppins on on this, and and again, it's not just that he's Jewish, and it's not just that he's at BYU. Yeah. Authentically, his experience around faith here has been transformational. I don't think he understood all of it when he came. He knew it was here, but we we were with him just a few weeks ago. We had Rabbi Soloveitchek from Yeshiva University here speaking at BYU at the Wheatley Institute. And we had Jake come meet him. And Rabbi Soloveitchek is one of the leading uh, Jewish intellectuals in America. And there he is with his Jewish quarterback. And I said <laughs> to our friends at Yeshiva University, we are so loyal to you. We put a Y on our helmets for Yeshiva. <laughs> and, <laughs> well played. <laughs> nice. But, nice. But these are bridges that we're building. And, and Jake, we don't have to hope, oh, I hope Jake will say something nice about the church. Because over the summer, before he was a star, the lead athletics trainer and nutritionist had a kosher truck come serve a kosher meal to the whole team yeah. to have them understand Jake and who he was. And the way our students on this campus, in the middle of protests against Israel and against Jewish people of Jewish faith, he's treated with respect. And so when the CBS story comes out, we don't have to hope Jake will say something kind about us because authentically his experience around faith at BYU has been transformational from long before he became a star. 
we, we've talked about so many good things that are happening right now um, with with BYU athletics and the, and the way they're representing the church. Let's take a look into the future, you know, 10, 15 years down the road as athletics continues to grow and, and be a big money thing. What role, you know, from the perspective of the church, do you see BYU sports, BYU athletics playing in the future? You know, I can't speak for the whole church on that. I, I can just say from the commissioner's standpoint, I need to make sure that everything we do reflects the values of the church everywhere we go. I don't know where college athletics is going to go. I don't know if it's going to go places. We don't feel that we can follow. But I can tell you, if we don't stay true to our mission, to our values, to our standards, it's going to be a lot harder to go to those other places. And so if you're a fan and you just love cheering for the team, I'm inviting you to make sure you cheer we do it the right way. And if you're not a fan and you wonder why we do this, if you like what you're watching, you can help us out by subscribing and hitting that notification button. I hope you'll see the good that's coming from these players, these coaches, BYU TV. Uh, it's a, we are building bridges. And you couldn't ask for a better way to enter the Big 12 than the way BYU came in. And yeah. you guys know, you follow social media. BYU has come in in a way no other schools come in. And... They're respected. We, we were just up this weekend with Oklahoma State fans who left, and of course they were disappointed about the game. But they said, you guys hosted us in a way we could never have imagined. We're coming back, and not just for the free ice cream. And I'm like, why do we give out ice cream on a freezing cold night? Yeah. But Sometimes it's a brownie, but yeah. <laughs> a brownie and hot chocolate sometimes, yeah. Um, but, let me ask you, we'll ask you a couple more yeah. football questions, and then we'll yeah. get to your keys to the game Great. for Saturday. Yeah. Um, visiting with Elder Gilbert, and it's just been fascinating. And I also love that you didn't ask us to tell you what questions we were going to ask you. Yes. And uh, we, we, we appreciate your trust in us that, uh, that, we, can, that we can do this in a, in a rare setting like this. But a few weeks ago, a student offered the opening prayer at Lavelle yeah. Edwards Stadium. She was on Zoom from her country uh, in Uganda, uh, she's getting an education through the BYU Pathways program. And when she finished her prayer and said, go BYU, there was the coolest feeling ever that shot through that football stadium. Um, Pathways, what impact is it having around the world? Because to many BYU fans, yep. that's all they've seen. And they're like, hey, what is what this? Is that? Yeah. So for those who don't know, BYU Pathway was started as a way to reach people who didn't have access or couldn't afford uh, traditional university education. And uh, it has grown, grow, grew across the United States, and now it's growing all over the world. Uh, today, there are over 75,000 BYU Pathway students in almost 200 countries. So it's big, its enrollment exceeds BYU and BYU-Idaho combined. Wow. And uh, one of the places it's growing most rapidly is in Africa. Um, this summer, uh, Coach Kalani wanted to create some opportunities for his students to serve and give back. And they looked at some options with some of his leadership, and they chose to mentor some of the Pathway students. And so that's where that, it wasn't just a random prayer. Right. There, was, there was a connection. Many of the players mentored those Pathway students. And um, th this particular student is just an amazing story. And she got on, and I loved when she said, and bless all friends from Kansas State. You know? <laughs> and everyone's looking up like, what is going on in this prayer? You, it yeah. was quiet. Oh, you could yeah. hear how quiet the stadium became, and, and uh, it's inspiring. And, and one of the things we've said to the, the athletes, the student athletes who are mentoring them, this is part of your fan base. You know, we, we have one of the largest fan base. We talk about Cougar Nation, mm -hmm. but we're Cougar World. We're, yeah. I mean, no one has an analog to that. And, and these, these BYU Pathway students have said to our football teams, you represent us. And the players have said, when we're out there on that field, we represent you. And it does, back to this theme we've been on the whole day, or the whole interview is, it's more than just a game. Yeah. Yeah. And those Pathway students, it's one of the great privileges of my life to have spent the time in that program and then to watch it just continue to grow. We should mention that Ch Chase Roberts, star wide receiver, is yeah. one of those mentors. Yes. Um, 
if, if folks want to read up about this, you can read up about it at Deseret.com. Put BYU Pathways in the search bar at Deseret.com, yeah. and, and that'll come up. And uh, you can read about what, what Elder Gilbert's talking about. And there's a scene. mentoring program. It's really cool. Yeah. There was a scene recently. They had a team meeting, yep. and up on the board was 100 Zoom <laughs> connections yep. with students from either Uganda or Nigeria yep. or one of those two. Yep. And they just converse back and forth with each other as BYU students, yep. not as people a world apart. Yeah, it's amazing. And, you know, I was, I was just in Nigeria in January and I asked all these pathway students, why is education so important in this church? And no offense to our students in Provo or Rexburg or Alaya, but they were as well-versed in our scriptural and doctoral reasons for education. And he thought, this is amazing. Yeah. And, and I'm just, I'm so grateful for Chase uh, and, and the leadership core of the team and coach for, for forming that relationship. And, and Ted Walsh did a w wonderful mm -hmm. job on that Deseret yeah. uh, profile. And it is really an inspiring story. If, if you add up all of the students because uh, you, you've been at multiple places, but BYU, BYU-Idaho, BYU-Hawaii, uh, the Pathways program around the world. Um, the slogan's always been, the world is our campus, yeah. right? Is this the biggest expanse of students of any university in the world? Or are there I others there? I don't know if it's in the world, but we have 150,000 students between <laughs> each of these programs in our church universities. And Pathways is a big part of that. But um, one of the things we try to do, and this is Zion, is we try to be one. And, you know, and that means everyone is united and, and everyone honors the different programs across the church. Elder Clark Gilbert, Commissioner of Church Education and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, is on The Wise Guys. Presented by Brady Plus, distributed by the Deseret News. We've had a lot of great topics. Now let's talk about something that's going to happen great. on Saturday. Great. Mm -hmm. BYU at Central Florida. Give us three keys to a oh, Cougar okay. victory. I, I have mine, but they're coming later. I'm going to see how they okay. match up with yours. I'll, so. give, I'll give you my keys to the game, and uh, I'll just, but give me a chance to close the interview Absolutely. after this. Yeah. Well, but, and by the way, you're going to be held accountable for this because next week we're going to review. And yeah, we're going to review. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and it's interesting. I'll, I'll be, while you guys are out at the game, I'll be in Lethbridge, Canada doing a YSA State Conference. Oh, man. And so yeah. my son says, Dad, I know you're consecrated because you're at some Marriott hotel somewhere reading about the game after the fact. And, um, and I'll, be, I'll be up in Canada and UTTV won't work up there. So mm -hmm. I'll just have to read about it. And, All right. But this is my this is my best take. First, um, I, I'm I'm anxious that to see the team limit the chunk plays and really to contain R.J. Harvey. I, they have a young quarterback. You talked about him earlier, and um, if we can contain him, they're going to make mistakes. So we just can't give up big breakaway plays. That's one okay. of mine, by the way. Limit, okay, limit mm -hmm. chunk Good. plays. All right, number two. Uh, it's related to this, but this was, I think, our problem Saturday on defense is we weren't playing assignment sound football. This team has played assignment sound football all year. Mm -hmm. And you had people try to start becoming the heroes, and they came out of their roles. And when we did that, we lost the contain on the defensive end. We lost um, people over pursuing. And... We've got, and Jay Hill will get him back. No, no this, hero ball. No hero ball. That yep. was in my point right there. Yep. It was my no hero line. ball. I love it. Okay. So and um, three, three. Uh, you know, I, you know, I debated between you know a couple things here, but I think we have to get feed the running backs. If okay. R.J. Martin can get lots of touches and and I don't know where Moa has gone but um, he, he was just back he was just cleared just before the game so he'll have another week he should be able to play okay. more this week but uh, we need to have clock control and if we get the running game going then Jake will just go crazy on passing uh, once he gets them the bite down on the run and feed the RB. Are, are you sure you, are you sure you didn't get these keys from president Oaks? Cause it sounds exactly like how he the, would yeah, think. Exactly. <laughs> establish the run to set up the pass. I like yeah. that too. <laughs> so, and, and again, Kalani's going to have to across, all the way across the country, our biggest travel week. Um, we, we did get the extra day and, um, and that's really a helpful, helpful this week with the travel and we don't practice on Sunday. So, 
you know, I know they went through some things on Saturday, and then they'll have a good week this week, I know, but yeah. but not to get out of our rhythms. And we haven't always yeah. done well on the East Coast, and so we'll see. But yeah. And it's, it's a little easier this week. People don't understand how hard it was last week. Um, a short week for BYU, a Friday night week without a Sunday practice, and that's just how we do it. And, yeah. and they've been successful yeah. doing it. But Oklahoma State having a bye changing yeah. their quarterback, changing their offense, and BYU only having three days to prepare for it, that's a tough task. Yeah, yeah. They have more, this week, even though they're traveling, they have a lot more time to prepare, and Central Florida had to travel to Iowa State and play in a tough game that they lost. I like this better yeah, than last week. Yeah, it's a good it's set up, and I heard you talking earlier. I like the way this schedule has played out for BYU yeah. and will keep playing out. Yeah. Um, it, it, even with Utah struggling, if we didn't have a bye week between here, I worry that would get our attention and we'd, we'd have a risk of a, of a mm. down week. I think we're still not favored to win, right? Do the, or no, did, they, did it, it switch over? It depends on who our source is. Okay. But, um, we're, we're slightly favored. Slightly favored, mm-hmm. so it's tilted up. Yeah, and okay. and we don't talk about betting it's trending on the show, in the right but what's way. happened is they set a line at 1.5 yeah. and it's grown. Yeah. So now it's like 3.5. Okay. So, Here's a grand finale and your parents here, so you, you really have to think about yeah, these this answers. Is, <laughs> this is... Five questions is presented by Strategy Square, delivering connection, clarity, and confidence in business and marketing strategies, owned and operated by a BYU alum who's helping the wise guys conquer the world. Here come five rapid fires. Great. We didn't prep you at all for this. So right. You were blind. Here we go. We're going to start with your favorite sports movie. His favorite sports movie is probably Chariots of Fire. I was a track oh. runner in high school, and in fact, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna close with a quote from it. But um, I love that movie. That's did a watch. You, that's a watch. Like that's one of my favorites too, and I haven't watched it for years. I'm glad you brought that up because I need to watch it. Did anymore. you ever pretend to run in slow motion to the oh, music yeah. with, the, with the music <laughs> playing bum, in the bum, background? Bum, yeah. bum. <laughs> yes. All right. All right. Your favorite singer or band performing artist. Well, I, even as a high school student, I loved listening to the Beatles, even though I was mm. a generation behind. Um, my, my, my dad's here in the studio with us, and a few years ago, he said to my younger brothers and brother-in-laws, well, when Clark and I were on our missions, as if I was in his era, <laughs> um, but I think my, uh, my uh, uh, Beatles would have been my the Beatles Beatles are awesome. father's era of music. Can, can never lose with them. Can you believe this guy right here is ACDC? <laughs> Well, it, we love all kinds. Yeah. It's all kinds. But he, now he's a country guy. I got to admit, in his old age, he's getting to be a country guy. So, oh. um, How about your favorite breakfast cereal? Breakfast cereal would probably be chocolate granola. Does that sound right? Chocolate granola? Yeah. Did you feed How do you even get like chocolate what? granola? <laughs> oh, there's a lot of options. <laughs> chocolate granola. It feels like to me that me the chocolate brand. cancels out the granola. I don't know. Chocolate granola. The end of it sounds healthy. The beginning does not. So, But we're going to go with it, and I like it. Because we make fun of people that eat. Listen, for two and a half years, we've asked every guest their favorite breakfast cereal. Yeah. This That's is the, the first, first chocolate, chocolate granola. granola. Da- da- nice job. Danny kind, Ainge. kind brand is the one you want. Danny Ainge hit us up with... <laughs> yeah. uh, um, Shredded wheat. Shredded wheat. And we go, like, clearly, you mean frosted shredded wheat. And he goes, no, like, plain shredded wheat. We go, but you, you put sugar on it. Just go out to the field and get some <laughs> and, and says, I go, why don't you just eat grass? Like, <laughs> So he's the worst cereal choice of anybody. This one's pretty good. I could sure. I could do chocolate yeah. granola. <laughs> kind brand. I'm going to try it. Okay, your favorite BYU memory. It doesn't have to be sports. Your favorite BYU memory of well, all time. I, I watched Danny. Speaking of Danny Ainge, uh, I watched Danny in the drive uh, mm. to come back against Notre Dame at a, on a big screen TV, that the ones that had the three lights in the projectors, yeah. the red, yeah. green, and, you know, and I watched it with all of these older guys in our ward, and I was the only kid, and that was for in, forever. Oh. Uh, since, but, I mean, we, we went, we were uh, at the, you know, the Michigan game in, at, yeah. the, um, at the Holiday Bowl in yeah. person. That would have been high up there, too. Thanks for that so, one. I remember that one. It's an interesting <laughs> that the feeling you felt when Ainge made the layup yeah. and when Lasseter crossed the goal line uh, this past weekend, they're, they're very similar. Where very you're just like, similar. what are we watching? Yeah. Did that just happen? Yeah, but I had my boys with me last weekend, which made Nate, that that's a even special more minute. special. That's a special moment, that's right? Cool. So, okay, okay. Th- this is maybe the most important question of all. Favorite advice that you've ever gotten from your wife, Christine? Oh, uh, th- this is a, an easy one. And I have an amazing 
a Christ-like wife. Um, we were living in Boston. I had just started the doctoral program at the Harvard Business School. I was in a program called Math Camp. It was six days a week for three weeks, all day long math. And I said to her one night, I can't do this. It's not a matter of working harder. I always had been a hard worker, but I'm like, intellectually, I don't have the hardware to do this, honey. Let's just switch to the MBA program and, and move on. And she looked at me and she said, Clark, you prayed for this. You know the Lord wants you here. So buck up and do the math. <laughs> and I did. Barely got through it, but without her... All of my service in church education wouldn't have happened. It's like a General Patton speech. Well, right I, there. so my that's I, awesome. the quote is, "Buck up and do the math." <laughs> it's great advice. I'm going right? to tell my daughter that very same thing. <laughs> yeah. um, that here's is a, awesome. We usually do five. Here's a bonus with your yeah. two parents here. How, how meaningful have these two been in this uh, journey you've been on? Yeah, they. they um, I have an amazing mom and dad, and and they they spark two things in me. Um, one was an intellectual curiosity, both of them. Uh, we traveled uh, and learned and studied where we went. We did reports on every place we went. And they, they embedded that intellectual curiosity. And, um, and then they gave me a love for the gospel. And those two things together combined for a love for BYU. They, it was planted in me from a time of, of a little boy. I love BYU with my heart. My dad had been the student body president at BYU Junior High, BYU High, student body president of BYU, the alumni president of BYU. Man. And I always knew, even as a student, that I would come back to BYU. And the Lord, I feel, planted that in my heart because of them. And then, you know, he never let me come to BYU. I, Got it. You know, the, the year I went to BYU Idaho and offered to run the entrepreneurship group at BYU in the Marriott School, and the Lord just took me in another path. And but that he that he used that desire that came from the early days with my parents to love learning, to love the gospel, and have them come together in a love for church education and BYU specifically. I think back to. Um your undergrad work at BYU. You were on your mission when Ty won the Heisman. They didn't yeah. even allow you to be here for the Heisman year. <laughs> I know. He's on next week, by the way. Oh, Ty will be in here next great. week. Yeah. He was amazing. I was in the MTC when he when he beat Miami. Is that right? Yeah, Do you remember and, hearing the crowd? Yeah, I could hear it from the <laughs> MTC. So. That's wild. Um, wait, maybe I know. I was just in the MDC for a game. I was on my mission when he, when he, when won he was that. there. Yeah, that might a member of the ward in Japan called us to tell us BYU would won. It's we'll crazy. to love ward members. They're the best. I called that game. It's one of the most electric wow. moments I've ever been involved in. Yeah. And of like the whole night was yeah. just electric. It was yeah. amazing. Wow. The stadium's felt like that a few times this year, though. Yeah. Kansas State, Kansas State night, was that, a wild one. Th this, this environment for BYU at home, everybody's just taken back by, they're taken back by the kindness, they're taken back by the sportsmanship, and then the sheer extravaganza that it is yeah. a BYU home game. Yeah. People just can't believe it. They, yeah. they leave and go, this is like no place yeah. else in America. And maybe this is where I could end. And yeah. We're not perfect. Uh, we don't, we're, and we're not going to be perfect. There's, there's no one in this church who's perfect. There was one perfect person, and that's the Savior, Jesus Christ. But we're striving to be our best. And that's what BYU has. We have to be something more. We have to have the courage to be different. Um, Rabbi Ari Berman, uh, the president of Yeshiva University, and my dear friend, came and did a forum at BYU. And it was one of the standing ovation from the students. And he talked about his little team at Yeshiva, and I think they're 3A or something, and they went undefeated the year, that whole year. And he said... Our players um, don't just play for a school, they play for a people. And I believe that's true for us. And you know, those players out there represent more than just the people in the stadium. They represent a faith, they re represent PYU Pathway students. Um, you know, and I, I referenced the Chariots of Fire yeah. clip. And uh, of course, the faith uh, figure in that story is Eric Little. And, uh, in, in that, his sister's pressuring him, like, you know, you are, you are a preacher. You follow God. Why are you running in these silly races? And Eric Little replies to her in the script, um, 
I believe God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. And, and that's, for me, when I watch those teams, if they're doing it in the right way. And remember in that story in Chariots of Fire, they moved his race to Sunday. And mm-hmm. he had committed he wouldn't run on Sunday. And he had to run a race that wasn't optimal. He still meddled. But he knew he would undermine everything he stood for yeah. if it really was just a race. And, um, you know, we, we aren't perfect, but I love this, this quote from President Oaks. And this, this would be where, where I would end my thoughts. And, and I said earlier, athletics is, for us, no different than the academic mission of the university. And President Oaks said, I firmly believe that it is the destiny of Brigham Young University to become what those prophetic statements have predicted it would become. This great goal will not be attained in exactly the same way that other universities have achieved their greatness. It will become the great university of the Lord, not in the world's way, but in the Lord's way. That's true for every part of this university. And I love President Reese. He is is a generational president. And... Um, I think this is what he means when he's talking about his phrase, becoming BYU. And we are becoming the Christ-centered, prophetically directed school of destiny. And we have to do it the right way, and we're going to continue to have pressures to be different. Yeah. And, um, and I, I just am so grateful for the coaches we have, the players we have, the athletic administration, this president. Um, But I'm also grateful for the governance that's in place at BYU to keep it grounded to its core mission and its core purpose. And as much as I love cheering on our Cougars, there's a deeper reason we cheer for them, and that's because of the mission of Brigham Young University. Well said. Elder Clark Gilbert with us. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. We're so glad you come into our... Lair. Undisclosed location. And yeah. thanks for bringing your program. parents. Yes, yes it was such a, and, such a pleasure to meet and them. It's fun to have Glad them with us Glad to have you with well. us, too. So Saturday, we'll be on BYU TV doing game day, and we'll think of you Great. in Canada. Yes. I'll be in Lethbridge. Lethbridge. And, uh, you can text and, us, and we'll give you updates if and, you need them. Uh, serving the YSAs up there in Canada, and uh, I'll be cheering you on from afar where I serve the Lord. We appreciate uh, our friendships, our association, and uh, certainly appreciate your time. Today. Thank you. Great thanks to be with you. Here. All right. Thank you, Clark. Thank you for watching The Wise Guy. If you like what you're watching, you can help us out by subscribing and hitting that notification button.